Coming up, big news for Tyson Fury. December the 19th with Wilder and the trilogy is off. We've got movement on big fights coming up for Josh Taylor. Fight of the year. Ben breaks down Loma versus Lopez and he's also joined by a man who shared the ring with Lomachenko with Anthony Crawler. Tommy Fury joins us on the show and we get stuck into all the big boxing news. Welcome to the show. I'm Adam Catterall. Pleasure as always to be in your company, as is this man here, who refers to himself now as Dwayne Johnson. I don't know why. He's more Don Johnson, is the lad. Ben Davidson, how are you, sir? You well? I'm good, thank you. A <laughs> uh, little bit of action from the weekend for us, obviously, to talk back on last week's guest, Liam Williams, who was relaxed, if you remember, on last week's show, talking about the big fights that are maybe just to be around the corner for him, uh, hopefully challenging uh, for world titles. He had uh, Andrew Robinson in front of him at the weekend. He's mandatory challenger for the British title, but Liam Williams did the business and he did it in quick, smart time as well. Ben, I just want to refer, and I'm sure you've been there, as we know, with Tyson and a nasty cut in the fight. There was a nasty cut that happened within the first 30 seconds of this fight at the weekend. And Liam Williams, who himself has been there before with Liam Smith, decided to get his man out of there quick, sharp. Yeah, I mean, there's a positive and a negative to take from that. I mean, firstly, I would say that the cut probably wasn't the type of cut that would end up stopping a fight because it was so far away from, from something that was blocking his vision. Um, I mean, obviously, like you say, he ended up going through the gears and, and getting Andrew Robinson away. The only thing I would say is, and I like Liam Williams, but, you know, he's a big step up from what he's been boxing to world level, you know, and um, not to say that I don't think he can do it, but Andrew Robinson wasn't someone that was going to prepare him for world level. Um, and neither is the opponents that he's boxed up to date, if I'm being completely honest. Um I do think Liam and Andrade is definitely an interesting fight. Um, I just I would have liked to have seen Liam Williams tested a little bit more, uh, maybe fringe world level before getting that fight. But if he gets his opportunity, he's got to take it with both hands. Good nights of boxing uh, on BT Sport. And we've got plenty more coming up over the forthcoming months. One thing that we were all looking forward to was part three of Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder. You may have seen um, of the weekend that there's been a few comments from Bob Aaron, from Frank Warren and from Tyson Fury himself about this particular fight not going ahead in December. The original working date was going to be December the 19th. Tyson has been on on, on national radio recently speaking about his, uh, his need and his want to get back out in the ring and, and do his thing, uh, even if it isn't going to be Deontay Wilder. And over the weekend, I spoke to Bob Aaron on, uh, on my radio show and he said it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in December and therefore Tyson will move forward. He'll have a he'll have a fight against somebody else in December and then hopefully move forward with the Anthony Joshua fight. And if I'm really honest, Ben, I personally think that the Deontay Wild thing is conclusive. We saw Tyson be amazing in February. He got the job done brilliantly. And I think the whole of our country and maybe the whole world when they're into heavyweight boxing wants to see him and Anthony Joshua get it on and they want to get it on soon. Yeah, certainly. The thing is, you know, Deontay Wilder is a type of fighter with the power that he carries. He's always going to have a puncher's chance, but that is it. That is his chance against Tyson. It's a puncher's chance. It's not. You don't look at him and think, oh, maybe if he if he did this, did that, he could end up potentially outboxing Tyson and make the rounds a little bit tighter, and then end up, you know, finding something off of that and building off of something. All you, it's a puncher's chance that he's got against Tyson and. As much as a big threat he is, Tyson's, you know, effectively beat him twice now. And um, it's a difficult one. Something, it's a difficult one because with this coronavirus situation, I don't know how the land lies in terms of contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, I'm sure that there must be, you know, the, the trilogy must take place or the rematch must take place within X time scale. But due to the pandemic and what's gone on, you know, I highly doubt that it was in the contract that if coronavirus tends to happen, you know, uh, there'll be an extension. So it's a difficult one. And if Tyson does get out in December, does it then void the contract for after that? I don't know. Um, so I suppose that's a, a sports lawyer's job to, to have a look at. But if it's possible, it'd be great to see Tyson um, fight again. And it'd be great to see him box in the UK as well. 
You bring up a, a really valid point there. Deontay Wilder, of course, activated his clause in March, but then we have gone through this pandemic, which nobody saw coming. I believe a week, sorry, last Friday was the date that they needed uh, for a concrete date in setting stone for the fight to be able to move forward, of which has now expired. But as you rightfully pointed out there, Ben, I've no doubt uh, with the pandemic and everything that's happened with coronavirus over the last six to seven months, um, I don't think this is the last that we'll have heard of that particular mm. uh, situation. Uh, one thing that did come out of that conversation with Bob Arum um, affects what your fighter, Josh Taylor, because obviously we've had him on the show recently speaking about the possibility of fighting for the undisputed super lightweight championship of the world against Jose Ramirez. We knew that there was a situation with Jack Catterall being the WBO mandatory and Jack Catterall has agreed to step aside for the time being in the proviso that he gets first crack at the unified champion. Great news for all boxing fans because becoming an undisputed champion are like hen's teeth in the modern world and a wonderful opportunity for Josh now to go and create some history. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's something that... that and something I mentioned before on the show about Josh, he sets himself new goals, you know, become a world champion, wanted to become a unified world champion, become a unified world champion, wants to become undisputed. And the fact that it looks like that opportunity will be there now, um, you know, I'm only too pleased for him and obviously excited to uh, to prepare him for it and have him ready and um, to achieve those goals. Listen, Ren, man, I know what you like. Have you already started checking the tape? Have you been, uh, have you been breaking down Ramirez? Yeah, to be honest, the first week that Josh spent with me, um, Ramirez was the opponent that I sat down and broke down um, to Josh about this is what I see, areas that I can see in in your game and things that we would work on and this is them working against Ramirez and how they would work against Ramirez. So, yeah, we've uh, we've discussed Ramirez and obviously we'll be going into more in-depth um, as well once that's confirmed and we get a date, of course. For people uh, that are maybe new to the program, we've got something very special for you coming up shortly uh, because Ben has given us access to his gym and he has broken down how he believes Lomachenko Lopez is going to play out this weekend. It's a real treat for you. But before we get to any of that, let's speak to a man who's got a bit of inside knowledge on what it's like to prepare for someone like Lomachenko and obviously to stand across from him inside the ring, uh, the former lightweight world champion, Anthony Crawler. Anthony, welcome to the show. How are you, mate? You good? I'm good, thank you, mate. Um, good to be here with you. Um, obviously, what I'm going to talk about, I'm looking forward to the big fight weekend. I would say, um, how's retirement going? But I can see that you're already in the gym there, mate. That's not retirement, that's grafting. You get it? You, no, you're you taking people on the pads now? Yes, um, ruining my elbows. No, I uh, something I really enjoy and always have done. But um, I'm staying half fit myself, but no, no rounds, been no three minute rounds for me or anything like that, other than holding pads and stuff like that as a, as a coaching role, but really enjoying it. Listen, we're going to get your expert opinion in a minute as a man that has shared the ring uh, with Lomachenko, but as a fan, and I know you're a massive boxing fan, I've been for many, many years, even well before your career. Talk to me about the anticipation of this at the weekend between Lomachenko and Lopez. Oh, for me, not just because it's like the old weight division and because um, of sharing the ring with Lomachenko. This is the fight that I'm probably looking forward to the most of 2020. It's been a very strange year, but uh, you could argue the two best lightweights on the planet. Um, there's, there's no one who would pick for lightweight and below to beat, um, to beat Lomachenko. But if, if I think if you're going to put someone in there with him who you think has got the best chance, Tiafimo Lopez has got to be up there. Um, I'm, I'm massively excited for it. And you know what? Credit to both guys. It's um, you know you got to give Lopez a lot of credit. He could look to have made a defense of that, but no, he's he's gone straight for the top dog, and I think he genuinely believes that he's going to do it on Saturday. Um, I don't believe it's just Cameron. He genuinely believes he's going to do it, but um, no, I can't wait. Should be a cracker. Listen, we're going to get your expert opinion on how you prepare for someone like Lopez. Uh, sorry, Lomachenko in a moment or two. But first of all, we went down to Ben's gym. That's right. He allowed us in. He allowed us into the gaff. And he talked us through in layman's terms how he thinks this fight might play out. Take a listen. Lomachenko and Lopez is such an interesting fight because we know that Lomachenko is one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. But we also know and fully aware that he's boxing outside of his original weight class. He's got somebody like Lopez, young, fast and big for the weight. So 
the physical attributes are definitely an interesting one and, and we're yet to see where Teofimo Lopez's ceiling is. So we're gonna go through some of the keys to victory for Lomachenko and also for Teofimo Lopez for their upcoming fight. And I've got one of the fighters that I coach, Lee McGregor here, British and Commonwealth champion to help me demonstrate. One of the keys to Lomachenko's game is his non-punch and activity. He describes it as getting his opponent to play to his music. He's got his opponent in front of him and he's constantly asking questions. It's almost like a vocal conversation. He's probing, he's adjusting distance, he's giving them a different head slot. They've then got to make a decision because if, he, if they throw a shot and I adjust distance, he makes them overreach, he can then make them pay. He can spin off around the side if they're committing, he can push them back with it if they're not sure what to do and they're constantly, whatever decision they make, if they st step back, he increases the tempo and increases the pace. If they throw a shot and try to counter, he's gonna make them pay and if they sit and wait, with all the non-punching activities, from thrown their timing off so he can be first and get a safe entry. Lomachenko is an extremely intelligent fighter. He's always the one that's in control of the pace, where the fight takes place, how the fight takes place, when exchanges happen. When you're the one in control in those areas of a fight, you're in control of the fight. Lomachenko is known for his shifts and in this fight it could play an important factor. Teofimo Lopez likes to poise himself in, in, the, in the shoulder roll guard and in the shoulder roll uh, position. If he gives this look to Lomachenko, it's going to be easy for Lomachenko. He's taking away his own hook. Is it going to be very easy for Lomachenko to get round the side, take away the left hook and right hand of Teofimo Lopez and get a safe entry into his attacks. Lastly, for Lomachenko, it's important that he doesn't lose sight of why he's having success and the non-punching activity is key to that. So if he's just walked straight in, he's going to be a target there for Teofimo just to time him straight on. As discussed, the non-punching activity, the adjustment, the distance, the different head slots makes it hard for the opponent to time him and punch with him. But if he just walks straight in, Boom, he's going to be there to be hit. Or he steps straight in with a shot, boom, he's going to be there to hit. So it's important that he keeps his non-punching -punch activity up, doesn't get complacent, as we saw against Linares, and doesn't walk straight in. Previously against Linares, seeing Lomachenko take that moment of switching off, get a little bit complacent, and he ended up getting dropped. Now if Teofimo lands that shot, is it a different outcome? It's a huge, huge step up for Teofimo Lopez. He's not been in the ring with anybody like Lomachenko. If he's completely bewildered by Lomachenko's IQ and, and can't match it at all, he could very quickly turn into a one-sided fight. We discussed about Lomachenko and the non-punching activity. For Teofimo Lopez, it's going to be important for him to have an answer to that non-punching activity. So if Lomachenko's here, he's doing his probing, he's doing his non-punching activity. Teofimo needs to give some form of non-punching activity back. Something we saw Salido do was level changes. He threatened as though he was going to go to the body, but from this position, I can shoot upstairs, I can shoot downstairs and come back upstairs, and he's going to then ask a question of Lomachenko, are you going to step back, are you going to throw? He's then forcing Lomachenko to make a decision. We partially spoke about Teofimo Lopez liking to go into the shoulder roll stance against Lomachenko, but from here, he likes to pick shots. He likes to, as opponents are throwing at him, he likes to try and catch them from the uh, shoulder roll stance, but it's giving Lomachenko an option to get round the outside. In this fight, if he gives more of a conventional guard and Lomachenko's doing this and tries to get round the outside, he can still able to throw. He's still got the option to bring his left hand into play. He can take his head down, but I think it's important that he throws to where Lomachenko's going, not where he is. Lopez needs to push Lomachenko back, make Lomachenko exchange and throw when he doesn't want to throw, and effectively have Lomachenko plan to his music. Then he can start working with and punching with Lomachenko and bring his physical attributes into the fight. So lastly for Teofimo Lopez, one of the advantages he's got going into this fight is his physical attributes. Potentially they should be a weight category or two apart um, and he needs to bring that into the fight. And one of the ways I see him being able to bring that into the fight is in the clinch. Um, going back again to the Salido fight with Lomachenko, it was something that Salido was able to do. When they got into a clinch, Salido would have his head in position, his hips back, he's then able to work. From here, he can punch out and force Lomachenko into exchanges when Lomachenko didn't want to exchange. And that could be a key for Teofimo in this fight.
That's my reaction. That's my reaction to that. That's why you're here, Rain Man. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, wonderful. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of benefit out of that from watching that at home. But it's a lot easier said with a with a fighter like Lomachenko than actually done. And I remember speaking to you in the aftermath of you fighting Lomachenko and some of the things that Ben was saying there about non-punch activity was a few of the things that you were bringing yeah. up there. And thinking about what this guy's going to be doing burns your head out. The mental stress that you put yourself under when you're in the ring with someone like Lomachenko is absolutely off the scale. I've, honestly, I thought Ben held it perfect. Then it's um, it does. It's constantly got you thinking, and, and thinking makes you tired. It's um, I always remember. I've said it to you before. Russ Abner, who's in the Lomachenko camp and you sit camp, he, he does the hands and the cuts. I remember a few years back, he was talking to me, telling me this was before there was ever any chance of me fighting him. He said he's been around boxing a long time, real box man. He said. He's the best I've ever seen. He says, he's like he's planning moves three or four moves ahead. He's seen them 20 seconds before they happen. And um, and that's what I feel like. And, you know, Ben Ben mentioned it there, like his non-punching activity. He's, he's constantly got you thinking and the judging of the distance, the way he'll switch it up. It's uh, That's what makes him so hard to read. And listen, if you can deal with that, then you have a chance. But like you just said, then knowing it, and then dealing with it sort of first hand in real life is, is much different. From watching Lomachenko on TV and preparing for Lomachenko in the gym, yeah. compare that to actually being stood across from the guy. Oh, c- comparing them. Listen, I think, you know, you're watching it and then, listen, he's a very unique special fighter. You can't, um, there's no, you know, with, with a lot of fighters, you'll get one sparring partner who can replicate that fighter you know, to a decent level. Whereas with Lomachenko, there's so many things you can do. You need three or four sparring partners. And that's what we had. And I think that's what everyone sort of has really um, who's preparing for him because there's not one fighter out there who does so many things well that Lomachenko does. Um, but I think with him, like, I was surprised at a few things. I um, I always think, you know, going to the fight, and you've probably heard me say it before, I wish now that the plan was to sort of for a few rounds. So I was never going to outbox Lomachenko, but to sort of box off him a bit, make him fall short a little bit, and then take chances a little bit more, and then I could exchange with him. Uh, we've seen the the bull matador, you know, type many a times where people think, oh, I'm just going to put it on him, Barcelona. I mean, far we don't want to be that guy. And listen, if I'd done that, I might have gone quicker, but I do wish I think I would have gone, you know, to try and put Lomachenko on the back foot earlier. But like I said, it might have happened earlier, might have been flattened earlier. Um, but I just think he obviously the way he judges the distance is is unbelievable. Um, he hits he hits harder than he expected. But what he does, he dresses his power up. And again, that was from that speaking to Russ Abner about, and he said, "No, what he'll do, he'll like he'll touch, he'll vary the power up very quickly. You know, he might touch, touch hard shot, hard shot, hard shot, touch hard shot, and it's and he hits spaces. He hits spaces very well, and he finds those spaces. He creates those spaces." Um, but I think actually being in there with him and watching, you know, even when you're watching him, you're thinking, wow. But I think when you're sort of, you can go in with all the planning in the world, but then it's sort of keeping a cool head, which which I didn't do, you know, once once he's putting that into action. Yeah, like Lomachenko, not only does he give you so many different looks, attack you in so many different ways, from so many positions, so many angles, he attacks you at different speeds, different power. Yeah. It's so hard then. You don't know when to brace, when not to brace. And this is what I'm talking about. And he explains it, Lomachenko himself, is you're playing to his music. So therefore, he's making you tense all the time because yeah. he's the one in charge. So he knows when he can lighten up, when he can relax a little bit, when he can conserve a little bit of energy, when he's going to put his foot on the gas. And the hard thing is you have to, if you think of it as a vocal conversation, he's constantly saying to you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? If you decide to do this, I'm going to do this. And therefore, it's so hard. But you have to be the one to then take control of that conversation, if you're thinking of it as a vocal conversation, and say, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do if I do this? And then Mm. you can start to dictate and take control of the conversation from there. But like you say, it's a lot easier said than done. (laughs) Anthony, come on. Can't have you on without a prediction, mate. How do you think this 
plays out. And I want I want precision, mate. I want rounds. If you think there's going to be a stop, if you think it's going to go the distance, come on, son, give it to me. Right, I think, what I think is, um, you know, you've seen things that are getting said in the build-up. And Lomachenko does, does, it seems like he's took things a little bit personal. And I think that he's, um, he's going to come out and he's going to look to put it on Lopez. He's going to look to put it on Lopez, which might, which might swing into Lopez's favour. This is the chance where I don't see anyone out boxing Lomachenko, but I think I know Salido how it hustled him um, a little bit, probably with the help of hitting below the belt a few times as well. But is, And Lomachenko is a different fighter now as well. A completely diff, totally different diff, fighter now. Man, totally, totally different, isn't he? It was, um, he was always ambitious in the second fight, no matter how good he was. But I... Um, I think if he, if he, I don't believe he'll hold his feet, but if he, if he looks to put it on Lopez a little bit more, it might, it might be there to be hit. Um, and Lopez, there's no, no denying Lopez is a world class puncher. You know, you picked up purpose, you know, that right hand, what Linares timed him onto, whether it's complacent. If, if Lopez hits him with that same shot, could, you know, could we be in for a big shot? Well, some people might not see it as a shot, but it's, uh, could we be in for that? Um, once, once Lomachenko, Cole sort of walks onto one of those rides from Lopez. It could be very different from Linares. But I, I believe, you know what I do believe? I, I believe that Lomachenko is going to target the body. Um, Lopez is big at the weight. There's no denying that. And I think I, I think after this, he might move up in weight and win a world title at a different weight. Obviously not if you and your man's about then, but you know where <laughs> I'm going with that. But, uh, yeah, I believe that. I believe he's going to hit the body. I believe he's going to hit the body and he's going to hit it hard. Um, I believe I believe he's gonna. I, th- I think he's gonna look to go on the front foot a little bit. Lomachenko might be totally wrong, and I think he's gonna look to go on the front foot. And he's gonna invite. You know, when we talk about that, that non-punching activity that Ben was on about and described perfect. I think he's gonna be he's gonna be teasing Lopez to throw to throw, and I think he's gonna taunt him and he's he's gonna look to humiliate him because I think that's what he does. He does that um, a lot. He look to humiliate um, Lopez and you know make him feel. But what he does, Lomachenko. It makes you feel a little bit useless, you know, making you making you miss with shots. He'll let you know when he's hit you with a good shot, whether it be the hand go out or whether he'll, he'll do a dance with his legs or whatever it be that. And I think every good shot he knows he lands, he's going to let Lopez know that he knows he's landed, if you know what I mean. And um, I see him I see him busting Lopez up. And I think around eight, nine rounds, we're going to see whether it be a towel, or a stoppage. That's what I believe. I think we're going to see a statement from Lomachenko on Saturday Ooh. night and a big one. That's me. I'm going. That's it. I'm no going mass. Lomachenko big. And I rate, I rate Lopez highly. I really do. But I just believe he's going to catch up with him, and uh, he's going to look. I think he's going to look to put a beating on him. Um, like I say, I see, I see a little bit of taunting and stuff like that. And I think I just believe he's he's going to go out there and he's going to look to put on a proper show. So Mr. Crawler thinks it's going to be a relentless performance from Lomachenko. Embarrassment, humiliation is what he's talking about there, Ben. Is that how you're seeing it, mate? Do you know what? It's a real difficult one. I mean, as we spoke about in, on the uh, on the breakdown there, I think that if Tiafimo does start resorting to the shoulder roll stance, it will really, really quickly become a real tough night for him. Um, if you go back to Floyd Mayweather versus Sab Judah, Floyd attempted the, first, the same thing in, early in that fight and had to then change and, and make an adjustment through that. Um, mm-hmm. I went to the conventional guard and had to start taking it to Zab. The difference is, I think, that if Tiafimo starts like that against Lomachenko, he'll be too far behind and too bewildered and too puzzled to, to make that adjustment. So I think the early part of the fight's an interesting one. And of course, like I pointed out before, I think it's key that Lomachenko doesn't get complacent. Um, but uh, it's a real difficult one. I wouldn't be surprised if Lomachenko really, really takes over, starts going through the gears and it becomes a one-sided dominant performance, but I wouldn't be overly surprised if he gets a little bit complacent and walks into one as well. Mate, listen, you two talking about this fight has got everybody salivating. Should be an absolute cracker. And thank you very much uh, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day, mate. And thank you very much for uh, building us up towards Lomachenko versus Lopez, former lightweight world champion there, Anthony Crawler, who shared a ring with uh, Vasil Lomachenko uh, last year, joining us on the show. Now, the guests are coming thick and fast, as they do every single week here on BT Sport. I recently caught up with Tommy Fury, a young man that's got a date, hopefully... Well, it's definitely penciled in the diary, but hopefully we're going to get some ink on that date very, very soon. I caught up with him yesterday, and this is what he had to say. Tommy Fury, welcome back to BT Sport. How are you, sir? You good? Yeah, I'm good, mate. How are you? Very well indeed. You're looking good. 
Yeah, I'm prim. Well, I, I was I was checking you out recently on the old Instagram, mate. You're looking like you're uh, you're tapering down. Obviously, uh, getting yourself into fight shape. Yeah, I'm already in fight shape now. Um, this is me. I'm super fit, super strong. Um, this is the best I've ever felt. So, just waiting to get in there, really, and do do the business. Massively frustrating year for a lot of people, obviously, with what's going on in the world. If, if I may, I just want to take you back all the way to last December because we, we got to see you in the ring very briefly. You were in there, in and out, no need for a shower type of performance. But how much of a relief was it to get back in the ring after a year of doing other things and maybe getting a, yeah. a, a, and getting a following in another walk of life? But it was nice maybe to get back in there and remind everybody that you're a fighter. Yeah, definitely. You know, I had um, a strange year for me. Um, definitely a year that I didn't see coming. But we, we, we rolled the dice, went along with it. And uh, yeah, it was a great success. And I'm just happy that I got to top that great year off with a fight back in the ring, doing what I love. Um, and I just want to point the message across, you know, to everybody that I'm not just a, you know, reality TV star or all this. I am a boxer. That That's what I, that's what I did my whole life. That's what I do. You know, I'm a boxer. I'm not some sort of um, TV guy. I've been in there for two months, yeah, in the sun, but that's it. You know, as soon as I come out of there, straight back in the gym doing what I love. And I just can't wait to get back in there now and keep the ball rolling. You know, ever since I turned pro, the fights have been fight, fight, stop, start, stop, start. But now yeah. I want to fight and just keep going consecutively and um, do it properly, get some titles underneath my belt. Given the the following that you now have, did you feel added pressure last last December when you stepped into the ring? No, definitely not, because my whole career has always been pressure. You know, ever, ever since being a little lad in the gym, oh, it's Tyson's brother up there, let's watch him spar. Oh, he's having an amateur fight. Just because oh, yeah. of the last name, people would turn up to the fights just to watch me. So there was always pressure there. And you just you just still in switch off. And it's the same thing that I have now. You know, when I fight, I don't see the crowd. I don't see the added pressures. I don't see the Instagrams. I just go in there and fight. And fighting something I know how to do. So I'll go in there and do it and I leave. Absolutely. And people forget as well, you're 21, 21 years of age. You know what I mean? You're right at the start of all this. It's not like you need to get things done because time's ticking on your career. You've got it all ahead of you. Yeah, I've got it all ahead of me. You know, everything there for me to be a world champion and to do great things is there in front of me. Look at the team I've got around me. You know, I've got my dad there. I've got Tyson there. Sugar Hill's over now. You know, it's it's all there for me to do great things. All I need to do is stay dedicated, stay focused and put the work in. And that's never going to be an issue with me anyway, because I do believe I train the hardest and the most dedicated. All I do is eat, sleep and train boxing. I don't do anything else. I don't have no other jobs. Um, I'm just, I'm just a fighting man. That's it. And all I want to do is prove to everybody how good I can be. On, on the goal side of things, because there will always be pressure on you, like you've said, because of the surname and because of the fame that you've acquired from the reality show, you've had three professional fights undefeated. You're 21 years of age. I just want to keep reiterating that to the boxing community that you're just starting out in this. But what are your hopes, dreams and ambitions over the next 12 months? We know we've got a pandemic. I'm, I'm assuming activity is one of them. But when we're talking about level of achievement, where do we want to be in 12 months' time? In 12 months' time, um, I just want to have a... A good amount of fights behind me, a good amount of experience, because there's one thing about the boxing game, we've seen it many and many times again, you know, you get good prospects and they get rushed into fights that they, that, that they shouldn't really be taking, but that's mm. not going to be an issue for me because I know my dad's at the back of me, you know, everyone's at the back of me and they all want to see me do well, so every fight I have, it'll be good learning fights and it won't be, we won't be taking fights for the money because that the money's not even in the question. I don't box for money or anything like that, I box it because I love it. So we're going to go on a nice, steady ride and we're going to get lots of experience. And in the next 12 months, we can see me fighting for some titles, 100%. Well, fingers crossed, mate. We get to do that on BT Sport. We're, in, we're looking forward to you confirming that date, looking forward to you confirming an opponent and getting you back out there. Do us a favour, though, mate. La make it last a bit longer. We, all, we, we blinked uh, last time listen. and it had gone. I know you don't get paid for overtime, but you blinked last time and it was over. Well, what can we say? It's just the power that I display, isn't it? But... Um... No, what happens is in boxing, if you see an opportunity, you've got to take it with both hands, and that's what I intend to do every time. If I smell a bit of blood, I'm all over you. Um, just in a bit cleaner manner this time, I think. Fair play, mate. Listen, go well. Enjoy the rest of the camp. We're looking forward to the announcement. Nice one, Tommy. Take care, mate. Thank you very much. God bless. Ben, you've spent a little bit of time uh, in Tommy's company. Um, what do you make of him as a fighter? And, and 
regarding all these out of ring distractions, and I don't know whether they are fully distractions because the career opportunities for him, do you think that he's managing to put those to one side now to concentrate fully on what he does inside the ring? I couldn't comment on it if that's what he's doing now. I think that's what he needs to do, but he's certainly, certainly got potential. I've always liked Tommy. I like him as a person. I think he's a good fighter. I'm not just saying that. Um, that's the truth. He can punch. Um, and I've seen him, you know, I've seen him go through the gears and, and look very good against some very good sparring partners as well. Um, I think he's seriously got some potential. And if he keeps his mind on the job and he's focused, then I definitely think he'll be achieving things in boxing. There you go. Hopefully we'll get that debt cemented in. In the not too distant future, you get to see Tommy Fury doing his thing once again on BT Sport. Thank you very much for coming to join us uh, for our show once again. Make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube so therefore you never miss out on any of our boxing content. And next week, I don't want to show off here, Ben, but I'm off to Fight Island, mate, for a bit of UFC. So when we're doing the show next week, I'll be in my trunks. I'll have the shades on. I'll have a night. I'll be I'll be nearly as tanned as you, mate. That's what that's how we're going to be getting this just, down. Just, just make sure you have a shave up before you uh, get on the camera with those trunks on. <laughs> I'll get a full wax on before I go, mate. And therefore, what we can do is pick the bones out of hopefully what we're going to get, a sensational fight between Vasyl Lomachenko and Tia Fimo Lopez. It's a history-making night. We are hopefully, as long as it's not a draw, going to get ourselves an undisputed lightweight world champion. Make sure you come back and join us next week as we pick the bones out of that. Have a great week. We'll catch you next time.